Hey gang, Mahesh Thapa here. Uh, and today I am hosting myself. <laughs> uh, we will be talking about landscape, well, actually 10 photography tips to increase or to better your photography. Uh, and I am really thankful for Sony and for B&H for allowing me to uh, have this platform to share a little bit of my knowledge with you. So let me just start my uh, screen share and we'll get started. So 10 essential tips to level up your photography. Uh, and I have a few disclosures here to make. Uh, Sony is sponsoring this event uh, because I am one of their Alpha Collector members. Um, uh, I do uh, all my photography that I post online uh, with, with Sony equipment and all the images that you see today here will be with uh, some combination of a Sony <clears throat> camera or lens. Uh, and uh, it may be a single lens reflex camera, it may be a mirrorless, it may even be a, a Xperia phone, uh, APS-C, full frame, what have you. All right, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, I am a landscape and nature photographer by trade. So much of what I'm talking to you is going to have that type of bias. But I think what you learn today can be applied to uh, any genre, really, uh, whether it's portraits, um, uh, action, um, some of these are fundamental rules that I think uh, can be followed by any type of photographer or creator for that matter. Uh, and this, I've deliberately made this talk for the beginner and the advanced beginner. Uh, some of the content may be a little too basic if you already know some of the stuff, but I think there's still a few tips that I can uh, pass along that will be helpful for a lot of people. Okay. Uh, I love this quote <laughs> by uh, Hack Wilson. If you don't know who Hack Wilson is, he was an old-time uh, baseball player uh, many, many years ago. Uh, and he said, in life, you need many more things besides talent, things like good advice and common sense. And I think that's so true uh, in the world of photography. I think many of us are have a great eye. Uh, a lot of the cameras do many things for us now with computational photography, uh, but there's still some fundamental knowledges that we need to attain, that we need to strive for. Uh, and hopefully I can provide you a little bit of that uh, as sort of a foundation for you as you go forward. Uh, these are the 10 tips I'm going to break down. There's going to be three tips on composition. Uh, and this is probably the most uh, basic portion of the talk. And then we'll build up to that. Uh, three, some camera setting tips that I think will be very, very help you, helpful to you no matter what kind of camera you're using. Uh, and three accessory tips that I use all the time uh, that I think will will help you, uh, you know, will make your life a little easier as far as being a photographer. Uh, and finally, uh, one tip about black and white photography. I think the black and white photography genre gets lost a little bit. It gets for forgotten. Uh, and I have one really great tip that will hopefully help you and uh, help you experiment with black and white photography and, and look at the world in a way where you can say to yourself, hmm, would this work better as a black and white image or not? Okay. So composition tips. Number one, basically, this is the rule of thirds. I think many of you have heard of this rule of thirds, uh, but but it's hard to apply it sometimes because you come to this great scene and you just want to take it in and you sort of forget this. But as you apply this rule, I think it, it'll become second nature. And basically it says that, you know, if you divide your scene up into thirds, whether it's horizontally or vertically, uh, try to place your main subject at one of the intersection points of those grid lines uh, with the rule of thirds. So for example, in this picture, my main focus of this is the lighthouse. Yes, you've got the beautiful Olympics in the background and you've got that bird flying, which is also sort of in the upper right-hand corner. But my main focus is the lighthouse. And I sort of strategically put that in the uh, lower left-hand side in that, in, that, in that rule of third area. And also, if you look at the image in general uh, and divide it into thirds, you notice that the horizon line, which is basically where the water meets the, meets the land, is also in towards the lower one-third-ish. It's not directly smack dab in the middle. So the upper third is occupied uh, by the sky and the, and the bird, the middle third, uh, mainly by the, the mountains and a little bit of the, of the trees, and the lower third by the, uh, by the lighthouse uh, and, and the water. So, you know, try to sort of keep that idea in mind. A, a couple of more examples. Here's a picture I took Along the Olympic coast, uh, this boy was sort of scrambling down from uh, the, the cliffs uh, and the sun was just setting and, was, and I sort of maneuvered myself. I had my uh, 7200 
uh, G Master lens. And I said, oh, this would be perfect. So I could have put the person directly in the center, but I thought this worked really well as sort of an off-center image uh, with the lighthouse in the distance occupying the left side or the left third of the image, a little empty space in the middle. Uh, and it's almost like this, this boy is looking into this crystal ball uh, as the sun is setting. And I love that rim light that's coming across. But this works so much better, I think, as a rule of third type of picture than had it just been centered. Uh, here's another one I took at the Palouse. Uh, unfortunately, this barn is no longer there. It burned down a few years ago, uh, but I was fortunate enough to capture this uh, while it was still around. And these beautiful shadows and light play was happening on the hills and the trees and the uh, and the barn. Uh, and again, I tried to make this such that the top half of the image or sort of the top third of the image was occupied by this beautiful sky, these cloud formations, the middle part by the light play of the shadows. Uh, and strong light, uh, side light on the hills. And the main subject, uh, which I think is the main subject, the tree in the barn is strategically placed in the lower third and lower the right third. You know, it's not directly in the middle, the, the lighthouse, the, sorry, the barn is sort of to the left, uh, to, the, uh, to the right. And if you look at the shadow, now, I could have put the barn on this side. I could have put it on the left side, but then the natural progression of light is from right to left and the shadow falls towards the left side of the image. So if I had placed the barn in the left lower uh, sort of third, then the, 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 the beautiful shadows will fall out of the picture. And that compositionally is not as harmonious, I think, as where it's placed right now. Where we can actually see the long shadows uh, sort of draping across uh, the left side of the image. So Yes, think about the rule of thirds, but it does matter where in that third you place the image to. Uh, something to think about. And, and, you know, Ansel Adams once said, he said, you know, uh, there are no good rules in photography. There's just good photography or good photographs. So, you know, take what I say into mind and think about that. What I tell people is know the rules of photography, know the rules of composition, and then make a conscious decision to break those rules for certain situations if you want. Uh, you know, don't, don't make it an accident. Don't, don't let the let your composition be an accident. Make, make it deliberate, uh, whether you decide to use the rules or not. Uh, this is sort of a, a corollary to the rule of thirds. And basically it says, and sort of what I've been uh, talking about is don't place the horizon directly at the center of the image, right? This is a shot I, I took uh, at, Arches National Park uh, several years ago. The sky was beautiful. Uh, the, uh, the rock formations were silhouetted against that. And I could have easily have put this in the smack dab in the middle uh, and just it wouldn't have the same impact as it does right now, sort of the lower part uh, with the horizon. Um, uh, the much more interesting part of the image, which is the sky, I think, uh, is at the uh, occupying most of the image. Uh, here's another one I took uh, in Death Valley many, many years ago. Actually, it's one of my first pictures. This, this image is almost 20 years old, but I still think compositionally it has the same impact. Uh, the top of the sky was sort of a boring gray, but there's a portion of the sky that was really interesting. Uh, these rain clouds that were coming down and this light was coming from the right side. It was just lighting at the bottom, but it was also providing this beautiful light on the foreground, these uh, salt formations. And in event, these salt formations, they're not very tall, but the light was so low that it still cast quite long shadows. And again, it's going from right to left. Uh, this certainly would not have had the same impact, I don't think, had I put the horizon directly at the center of the image. So two notable ex exceptions, I think, for placing the horizon in the middle, where you, I think it's okay to put it in the middle. One is sort of the cityscape, because oftentimes, tall buildings from cityscapes are poking into your sky. And even though the, the horizon is sort of in the middle, the, the, the buildings poke up to occupy about another one third of that area. So really, if you think of this line as being the top of the pseudo horizon, if you will, you only have this much of the sky, which sort of, again, falls that, follows that two thirds uh, on one third rule. But it's okay in this case to have in the center. Also, it helps that the sky is just as interesting as the foreground where you have uh, I-90 coming into to, to Seattle and these sort of light streaks, light streaks that we have built up. And finally, reflections. I think reflections is a great place if you want to have it perfectly 50-50 because what's in the bottom 
is just as interesting as what's on the top. In fact, it's just a mirror image of what's on the top. So I think uh, uh, a center horizon on a shot like this really works well. Uh, whether you want to do two thirds or one third, that's fine too. But this is one of the, I think, the acceptable places to do a center center composition. The next uh, tip I have for you is whenever possible, use leading lines or S-shaped curves to draw the viewer into the photograph. If you look at each one of these images, you can see that there's some kind of a line or a curve that leads you from the foreground into the background. You know, whether it's a little meandering stream that goes into a little puddle of water or a small lake, uh, or it's railroad tracks that sort of go out into infinity, uh, or it's the, the ridge line of uh, where, uh, sand dunes meet. These are all great ways of drawing the viewer into the into the image. And as you sort of go out, take pictures, you'll see plenty of leading lines. Uh, and if you try to incorporate them, these curves and leading lines, you'll come up with, I think, much better images. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you know, you can compensate for the lack of light by by looking at compositional elements and that they're, they 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 really go hand in hand but one can compensate for the other if, if you're lacking in one. Here's another example uh, uh, in, uh, in Idaho. Uh, had, I, had I put this leading line, for example, directly in the middle, that wouldn't have worked. And if you look, I still, I am doing the rule of thirds, right? Uh, you've got top third being the, the sky and the mountains, the bottom third being the lake, um, the reflections and the leading line uh, coming from the right one third. Again, I don't have this, this log directly in the center pointing pointing in. I actually have it slightly towards the right side to the right one third, and it sort of leads my eyes into, into the scene. So we have a combination of both leading lines and rules of third uh, on this image. Uh, here's another one, leading line. This is the waterfall, Palouse Falls uh, in Eastern Washington. Uh, again, you, as you sort of meander through this image with your eyes, you can see that there's this this cliff base that that has a nice S curve leading you right to the waterfall. You follow the waterfall down, and your eyes naturally go along the course of this little river to the distant mountains. Um, and you've got a little bit of sky on the top. And this was taken with an ultra ultra wide lens. This is uh, probably a fourteen millimeter uh, lens. So. Uh, I tried to get as much of the scene as I could because there really wasn't a lot of space here. I was at the cliff edge and I couldn't really, you know, walk <laughs> any, any closer uh, or angle my camera down anymore. So this was, so sometimes you really need an ultra wide perspective uh, and don't forget about your compositional elements and leading lines. Here's one more. This was taken in the Palouse with a very, very tele uh, long telephoto lens. This was taken with a 500 millimeter lens. I was standing up at uh, Steptoe Butte, looking out into the distance, and the leading lines here are these little uh, curves, you know, where where you have this sort of uh, uh, water uh, irrigation system going through the wheat fields, and it looks like it goes, it goes right here to the tree, so the eyes really follow it. And if you look again, the rule of thirds is still maintained. The tree, which is the main subject, is at the upper left-hand corner, uh, and you've got uh, these curves going from the lower right hand uh, third all the way out to here. So it really brings the composition in very nicely, I think. A similar type of picture in black and white. Uh, now, these are leading lines, but this is a more quote unquote centered composition because this sort of farm here is centered. And you think, well, oh, here's the horizon. That kind of looks centered too. But if you notice, you have actually have mountains here above the clouds. Uh, these are the Olympic mountains in the distance. And they actually break up the, the the image nicely into thirds. The top part, the top third is your is your interesting cloud formation. Your middle third is the farmland, uh, and uh, and uh, and the mountains. And down here, you've got those leading lines, uh, which works really well in black and white. And I'll sort of come come to this black and white concept uh, as as the final tip. Um, but this is an example of leading lines that works well, I think, for a composition like this. And a final composition tip I want to uh, leave you with is uh, looking for natural frames. Now, this I was waiting for a ferry uh, to go across uh, Puget Sound to the to the islands uh, in Washington, and I was in my car. I was, I was parked, and I, said, I just saw this nice composition. This is the dock 
where the ferries come in. Here's one ferry. You can sort of see through the ferry a little bit. These are cars that are that are that are being transported back and forth. Another ferry in the distance, uh, and this lady just waiting for that. But but all of this is framed within the dock itself, and <clears throat> I think it does make a nice pleasing composition. Uh, even though there's sort of centering of the of the image. There are enough elements. For example, the horizon is still at the lower one third. Uh, you know, one of the main subjects, which is a lady, is sort of at the left one third. There's enough elements compositionally that this is pleasing, particularly because it's bounded by these natural frames of the dock. Uh, here I was uh, on the Oregon coast. This is sort of a low tide, uh, and there's little caves that are over there. So I went deep inside a cave. Again, used a very ultra wide angle lens so I could get the entire view of the of the cave to form this little um, to bracket, if you will, this this rock rock formation. And I went low enough to get a little bit of that moon. So again, look for these natural frames. And if you sort of look at the horizon, the horizon here I placed at the upper one third. Uh, and not that that pen in the center. Even the composition itself has framed sort of in the center. The horizon is still at the at the upper one third. Uh, this was taken at Arches National Park, looking through uh, uh, one window onto Turret Arch. Uh, lucky enough to get the moon in that in that frame. But again, these natural frames really allow for a pleasing composition. And if you sort of look carefully, the horizon really is at the lower one third. And because the sky is so interesting, I included more of the sky. Uh, I could have I could have gone a little higher and aimed down. So more of the Tourette arch and less of the sky was uh, in the in the field of view. But I thought the sky was really interesting this particular morning. So I, I, I angled the camera such that I included more of the sky, more of the two thirds of the sky and just one third of the of the land, if you will. Uh, this was taken in Seattle, and you know, you can get creative with your framing. There was no natural framing, but there was a water fountain very close by. So I had my wife, you know, press the button for the for the water fountain, and this created this beautiful arch. Uh, it had been raining, uh, which created this beautiful rainbow in the distance. But I was able to frame the city uh, under this "quote unquote" natural uh, natural frame or natural arch of the flowing water from water fountain. So look for these creative. Uh, uh, elements, if you can, if you and, and if they aren't there, try to create it. This is uh, one more in Seattle. This is a Discovery Park. Lots of driftwood out there. Uh, in fact, driftwoods come in all shapes and sizes. And and you know, along the beach, there are many many ways you can compose this image. You know, a lot of people just take a shot of the of the lighthouse or maybe the mountains, but you can look for little creative elements like this. So I, I angled myself low. I, I moved towards the, uh, a lot of people shoot it from the water end, the left side. I shot more towards the land end because I wanted to incorporate uh, these uh, these beautiful driftwoods to frame the lighthouse in the distance. Okay, so those were the three compositional sort of advice I had for you. Now I'm gonna go to camera settings uh, and I think these are these are also very helpful, and hopefully you get something out of that. One is try to shoot at the lowest native ISO. For example, many Sony cameras, the no, the native ISO, the lowest native ISO is ISO 100. Uh, why is that? Because ISO one, the lowest native ISO has the the most dynamic range. Uh, it has the most color fidelity, and it has the least amount of noise, right? So when camera manufacturers quote their dynamic range, they say, oh, 14 stops of dynamic range, 15 stops. They're talking about their lowest native ISO. There are also camera settings where you can go below the native ISO, like ISO 50 or ISO 64, but has a little L next to it. That is just a gimmick, in my opinion. What it basically does is it shoots it <clears throat> at... Uh, Let's say you're choosing an ISO 50. So what it actually does is it shoots it at ISO uh, 100, but then, then underexposes it by one stop uh, in, in post-processing. So you actually lose a little bit of dynamic range in the highlights uh, while sort of getting a little bit of nominally more increased dynamic range in the in the shadows. But this is no different than if you would have just shot this at ISO 100 and, you, and underexposed it yourself or shot, shot it at ISO 100 uh, and overexposure by one stop, and then and then and then one to post processing. So try to shoot it at the most, uh, at the lowest ISO that you can, 
you know, staying within the constraints of, of, of shutter speed, right? If, you're, if your ISO is low, but the shutter speed isn't high enough uh, and you get blurry images, then you may have to bump up that ISO. But I, I sort of, I'm using a tripod almost all the time. So I, I never really worry about shutter speed being too long because I'm often on a tripod uh, and I wanna maintain the greatest dynamic range, the most color fidelity, um, and uh, the least noise possible. <clears throat> and that happens at the lowest native ISO. Get familiar with the histogram. Uh, if you're not used to using a histogram, uh, <clears throat> look into it. And, and it's, it could be very valuable because oftentimes when we're looking through the viewfinder or looking at the LCD screen, it's hard to judge the overall exposure or brightness depending on if what, what kind of scene we're in. If we're in a very brightly lit area, it may look a little washed out, but the histogram doesn't lie, right? Histogram, no matter what lighting conditions you're looking at your images under what condition, is always gonna show the proper exposure or what the exposure of the image is. And try to make that histogram so that it's a relatively even distribution uh, of the curve between the very dark areas and very bright areas. Let's say you take a picture, um, and everything is bunched up to the left or everything is bunched up to the right, that may not be what you want. Uh, I mean, it may be depending on the effect you're going for, but usually you want a nice uh, normal appearance of that normal gram of that histogram. And then if you have that normal gram, you can later in post-process, uh, post-processing, make it look however you want. You can crush the shadows, you can increase the highlights, you can have a low key, high key type of image, but all the data is there for you to work with. Uh, by by having a nice normal histogram, then you can be be creative with it later on post processing if you wish. So get familiar with the histogram, uh, turn it on. A lot of people just have it turned off. Uh, there is a histogram for colors for red, green, and blue, and there's a histogram for the total all overall brightness. Try to use uh, all four type of histograms if you can. The color ones tells you which colors are being clipped or not. And the and the and the brightness one tells you which if it's overexposed or underexposed. So try to look at all those if you can uh, and learn from it. Uh, and the third tip I have is is to try to use those custom dials. So oftentimes, in many cameras, Sony included, there's these little custom dials that are usually able one, two, or three, and you may just have one custom dial. I don't know. So what I typically do is, if I only have one custom dial, I make sure it's the custom dial that I can just turn the camera to so that I can capture fast action stuff. You know, my son running around or a bird flying back, which means a, a high shutter speed, auto ISO to maintain that high shutter speed and the, and the widest aperture possible to let in as much light as possible. So that's custom setting number one, for example, uh, because let's say I'm shooting a landscape scene where I have uh, you know, ISO at 100, aperture, you know, F8, F11, uh, the shutter speed is like two seconds, three seconds. But if some, a bird goes by or animal goes by, I don't want to be fiddling with the camera saying, okay, let's pick the ISO up to 1600, aperture down to F28, uh, uh, too much to think about. If you could just dial, turn that dial to a custom setting where all those are already set for you, boom, you take a picture of that bird, you're done. And and, and and you've done the best you can. At least you know that if you miss the shot, it's not because you're fiddling with your cameras. It's because, you know, the conditions still weren't as, as great as could be. And that's what I do with my custom settings. I have one setting for bird in flight. I have one setting for like a uh, bird that's stationary. So meaning that it doesn't have to be quite as high uh, a shutter speed, uh, but still high enough that if it's moving its head or looking one way or the other, I still am able to capture it. Uh, and third, uh, for... I have bracketing set because I do a lot of bracketing with my landscape images. But for example, uh, here's a nice picture of a landscape boat. You know, I can take my time, have the aperture setting for this. But all of a sudden, you know, if I'm on a hike and and I see this beautiful light as my my wife and son go from shadow into light and quickly into shadow again, I want to be able to turn my dial to a high shutter speed uh, auto ISO setting so I can capture that quickly without having to think. All I have to think about is the composition of how I want the image, not the other camera settings. So try to get familiar uh, and use these custom dial settings, particularly for, for shots that are quick action, um, happens quickly and you can't, you can't predict it. Uh, next part, the third part of the talk is going to be about a few accessories that I think uh, that you 
will find helpful. So I always tell people, you know, it's really, really helpful, particularly if you're getting blurry images or if you are not getting quite the, the type of shots you're looking for, carry a tripod. Right? I'd rather carry a tripod than an extra lens because, uh, you know, this virtually guarantees you of getting great steady shots, particularly if the light goes low. You know, you don't have to bump up your ISO too high so you don't have grainy images. You can maintain a low ISO so you so you maintain that dynamic range, the color fidelity, right? And you get these you get these long exposure type of images if you want. And I carry a shutter release also. That way I don't have to touch the camera at all when I take a picture. The less touching of the camera you do, the better it is because there's less room for error, such as little vibrations when you when the when the shutter goes off, uh, or 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 if you the shutter gets released exactly when you pressed it, because if you have it on a timer, for example, you still have to have a two second timer, right? So let's say something's happening now, you press the button, you have to wait two seconds before the shutter goes off. That's why a remote remote shutter is 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 super helpful because it takes the picture right when you want it. And remote shutter is also helpful for when you want to be in the picture. So for example, you know, I had this tripod set up and I wanted to be in this picture for the for the waterfall. You can't tell, but you know, I have my remote shutter in one of my in, in this hand over here and I'm pressing the button and it's taking the picture for me back here. So a steady tripod and a remote shutter and they go hand in hand uh really to uh to create uh well exposed, low noise images. Next, we'll talk a little bit about ND filters. Now, people get a little <laughs> antsy when they talk about filters, but I think uh, ND filters are worth uh, investing in because it allows you to get creative in multiple situations. It's not just for landscape, it's actually great for uh, for portraits as well. Essentially, ND filters are sunglasses for your lens, right? Uh, and, the, and the really good kind, the really uh, good filters are completely colorless, the ND filters. Uh, this is just an example of a, a skylight type of filter that you use at night, so don't, don't, don't worry about this. But these are the ND filters down here. Uh, and the really good kind, they're, they're a little expensive, uh, are, are completely colorless, meaning that when you take a picture of an image, there's no blue cast or magenta cast or orange cast. It's just all it does is it prolongs your exposure time. It doesn't change the white balance or anything like that at all. Uh, and essentially, you know, each stop that an ND filter is designated is 50% less light that gets inhibited from hitting your sensor. So for example, let's say you had a just a scene where it where, where without any filter and it said, oh, you know what, to get the proper exposure for the scene, it takes one second. Now, if you want to prolong that exposure time or double it to two seconds, then you put a one-stop ND filter. If you want to prolong the exposure to four seconds, you put a two-stop, eight seconds, three-stop, and so on and so forth. So I think you get the idea. So as you can imagine, you know, unless you want to take a nice picture of a waterfall with a silky appearance and it's too bright out, then you put an ND filter on, right? Or let's say uh, you want to have these beautiful effects on the cloud where they look like they're moving and they're sort of blurred out, you put an ND filter on. That's what, that's what in landscape wise, that's what's good for. So when do you use it? To prolong the exposure time for landscape. But it's also great for portraits. So oftentimes you're shooting outside, it's very, very bright. You know, you have, you want to create that nice shallow depth of field. So you're shutter F1.8 or F1.2, but your shutter speed is still way too slow, even at one eight thousandth of a second, for example, to maintain that wide of an aperture and that bright of a condition. So in which case, then you put an ND filter, which allows you to open up that aperture as wide as possible uh, and still maintain the proper exposure uh, by staying within the limits of your camera's shutter speed, right? So it's great for that kind of photography as well. And it's really great for astrophotography in the daytime, particularly for solar eclipses. So oftentimes you need like a 16 stop, oftentimes combining, you know, several ND filters, maybe 20 stop of ND filter, because these are really intense light. Uh, and you couldn't do eclipse photography, for example, uh, without, without, without these uh, uh, filters, because first it would just burn out your camera uh, sensor. 
Uh, and second, you just would never be able to achieve the type of exposure that you need. So consider ND filters uh, when you want to be a little bit more creative in the type of photography that you want to create. When you look into these filter systems, you're going to see several types. You're going to see these quadrilateral, what I call quadrilateral filters. They're basically square or rectangular filters. Uh, there's going to be round filters, and there are going to be drop-in filters, uh, like over here. So quadrilateral filters, they need a, a sort of a bracket or a filter adapter that goes in front of your lens, and you drop these filters in uh, to get the effect that you want. The round filters, which is what I recommend you first start out with if you've never used filters before, is you just screws on to the front of your lens. Uh, I like these in particular because they're portable, they're they're easy to uh, to change uh, on and off, and they're often uh, less expensive than the than the quadrilateral type of filters. Okay, and you can get them at various strengths: polarizers, ND filters, skylight, whatever they make for the quadrilateral, you can get for the circular round filters. You know, the, the downside, of course, is that if you add more than one filter on, oftentimes because, you know, it's directly on, on, on front of your lens, when you stack filters, you're going to get some vignetting, which is sort of a, a darkening of the corners because, uh, uh, because of the way the light is trying to hit the sensor and uh, traveling with a little extra bit of glass and that's directly in front of your, uh, in front of your lens. So you may have that problem. Uh, but starting out, I think, I think circular filters are really great. And there's these other type of drop-in ND filters. Basically, there are certain lenses that are bulbous in the front, um, which you could use a quadrilateral type of filter, but it would take a huge bulky system in front of that lens to be able to drop these, these, these large filters on. With the, with the drop-in filters, it, they've, they've taken the idea of putting the filter in, sort of in front of the lens. Uh, they're gonna put it on the back of the lens. Where, where the lens mounts onto your camera. So you can actually unscrew a little bit of this. Let's see if I can make this bigger. Can I make it uh, you can unscrew a little part of the lens back here uh, and then drop in these filters, these tiny filters, and then put that up against your camera. <clears throat> so instead of it being in front of the lens, it's behind the lens. It, it works for certain specialty lenses and they, and they work great. But again, it's a little bit more advanced, takes a little bit more fiddling with, but something to consider if you don't want huge filters that go in front of a bulbous element uh, of your of your of your lens and, and a few other accessories that I think are essential for 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 at least for my type of photography that you may want to look into uh, a filter wrench these are filter wrenches particularly if you're using these round filters in front of your lens an ND filter or polarizer and if you're stacking them and if you even if you're not stacking them you go from like hot weather to cold weather or vice versa they get stuck there and you try to turn it you try to turn it and you can't you know it's essentially you've got a lens where you can't take the filter off which is not great but these little filter wrenches are great because they've got this grippy material on the inside you you put it around uh, around your lens and then you turn and it gives in it and I've never ha had a problem where a filter wrench has not been able to unscrew uh, stuck filters uh, either to each other or to the lens so I, I, I always carry uh, a set of filter wrench uh, in my in my in my bag headlamp uh, particularly with red or green light is essential particularly for night photography the red light and green light uh, it doesn't uh, play havoc with your eyes, and it doesn't it doesn't play havoc with your uh, with your partners or your uh, or other people's uh, uh, exposures or or their night vision. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, green light is a little easier to see if you have marks on your lens where you've marked the infinity point. Certain certain lenses, um, the infinity mark on the lens isn't quite where it should be, so you actually have to physically make a make a line. If you use like black ink. Uh, or 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 other ink colors, it's difficult to see with the red light, but the green light will really let you see that very well. So uh, I have a headlamp with that has both a, a red and uh, and green colors. So so look look for look for that. And of course, the bright light itself, white light, is good for when you're going on hikes at night and need to see the see the road or pathway. But try to get these multicolored uh, headlamps if you can. And finally, absorbable hand towels. Now. These are readily available at like an automotive shop. Like I go to a Costco automotive section and they come in like packs of 20 or 30 for like 15 bucks. So they're really cheap. And I think they're much better than any of those little 
tiny cloth, lens cleaning cloths that you get, you know, when you when you buy a lens or or, or they or you can hang on your keychain because they're huge uh, and they have and they have microfibers, so they're just as good at cleaning your lenses and just as safe. And you can use it to not just clean your lenses, but your entire camera because it's like a it's like a big washcloth, and and you get so many of them that you can put one in every bag. Uh, you can wash them, reuse them. They work great. So I always have a few of those handy um, when I when I go out. So these are three things that are always in my bag, no matter where I'm going. And finally, the last tip is about black and white photography. Just to get you thinking, if you haven't done a lot of it, um, is is you know is is it worth doing? How do I decide whether something's going to be good in black and white or not? So here is an image. Uh, this was taken in the Japanese garden in Port Portland. This 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 monk was walking by, and let me show you the color image. Not 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 to say that one image is better than the other, but just to get you thinking about black and white images, particularly with various color filters. So here is just a, a conventional color image uh, that I took and I just converted to black and white. I just said, okay, monochrome it, make everything just take all the color out without any emphasis on any of the colors, right? And it sort of has this drab uh, look to it. There's really no separation of any of the elements. Sort of the, sort of the monk kind of blends in with the trees and it's hard to tell, you know, the, the bridge really stands out. So this is just a simple conversion. Now, this is a simple conversion, no filter on the left. This is with, with a green filter. So now I'm, not, I'm not actually putting a green piece of glass in front of the lens. That's not what's happening. What I'm doing is, is in Photoshop or Lightroom, and you can sort of look, look into this in, uh, in YouTube, it's very easy. You can emphasize how each of the colors are being treated when it gets converted to black and white. This is very similar to what they used to do in film days with black and white film. If they had a black and white uh, uh, a camera uh, or the monochrome, for example, like a mixed monochrome, uh, you can put color filters in front of the lens. And this is what you're doing essentially without the color filters in post-processing. So the green filter, typically the color that you're talking about makes the color of that image brighter. So a green filter, really makes the green foliage look really bright, almost has an infrared look to it, right? So look at what happened. And I've done nothing else. All I've done is convert from color to black and white with an emphasis on the green channel, if you will. And and look what, look, all the green color here has become really, really bright. Look what's happened to the red of the monk's clothing, right? So. Each filter has a complementary effect on certain colors. So the green has a complementary effect or an opposite effect uh, on things that are red or orange. So those, those colors end up being darker for the green. Sometimes uh, the blues also become a little darker, but it's not as effective on the blues as it is on the greens and the red. So this is the green filter. Now, this is the blue filter, right? The blue made the greens like almost completely dark, right? And it made the red, very dark also. Again, here's the green filter and here's the blue filter. I mean, such a dramatic difference between which one you ended up using. And one last one, this is the red filter. So the red filter, notice how the red of the clothing became really, really bright because it's a red filter, so it has a brightening effect on the red colors as opposed to the green has a brightening effect on the green colors. And the blue has a brightening effect on the blue colors because if you look back on the color image, there's a little bit of blueness in that in that bridge, right? So when you put a blue filter, that bridge really pops out as a blue color. So when you're looking at color images and you think, you know, would this be great in black and white? Look at what predominant color there may be. And then think, you know, this is going to be really light when I convert this, or this is gonna be really dark when I convert this. So that's something to think about uh, as you play around with the idea of making black and white images. I'm gonna give you one more example, that's a landscape. So here, here's sort of the composite of all the uh, images. Here's the color image. Uh, this is the image uh, on the left with just a simple monochrome grayscale conversion. This is with blue conversion at the upper left. 
This is with green conversion on the lower right, and this is with red conversion on the upper right. So you can see, depending on which color you want to emphasize, it really has a dramatic effect and changes the mood of the image. So one more example for you. So this is a picture I took at the Palouse. Um, you know, you've got this beautiful blue sky with some charismatic clouds. You've got green hills, uh, uh, yellow wheat fields, some warm light on it. So if I just took that and convert it into a simple monochrome image without any emphasis on the colors, you get an image that looks like this, uh, which is, I think, nice. It's still nice, but it's not as dramatic, maybe, as you might want it. So that as the reference, no filter. Here's the one with the green filter. And if you notice, some of the wheat fields are a little bit brighter, but but and the and the green part. See, remember, remember this 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 part is a greener than this part. So that part becomes lighter than the regular conversion because the green makes green brighter. But there's not so much green in it that it becomes completely white because a lot of it's still yellow, has a, a, some yellow light to it. It really has not much effect on the sky at all, right? So, but, and it has minimal effect because there isn't a predominant bright, bright green color like we had uh, in the foliage uh, of the Japanese garden. So the green color, it makes everything lighter, but not as dramatic. Now, take a look at the blue filter, right? Blue has the exact opposite effect. Remember the blue in the sky, it actually made it lighter. It made, it made it light because it converts the same color into a lighter shade here. This is a non-blue non uh, emphasis, blue emphasis, mirror. but look what I did to the green and the yellows. I mean, it's it's just completely dark. And because there's a little bit of blueness in that, in that, in that barn or that shed, it maintains its relative brightness. In fact, it's a little bit brighter than it was in a conversion without any filters. So now, Here's a red filter. I think red filter, particularly for landscapes, uh, is very, very helpful because oftentimes you're looking at blue skies and it turns blue skies dark and it, and it really uh, brings out the contrast between the white clouds and the blue sky. So this is what this is what I did. So without the red uh, emphasis, it sort of looked like this, but with the red emphasis, red filter, it really brought out the drama. And look what it did, because the yellow has some component of red in it, right? Because yellow is, uh, is sort of partly red, if you will, uh, and 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 that became really bright uh, because it it converts similar colors into a brighter shade. Uh, and the barn itself didn't get affected too much because it has not a lot of effect on the blue. So looking at this in the various conversions. You see, here's the original image. Uh, the simple, no, no emphasis, black and white conversion gave you something like this. Something with a blue filter made the sky brighter, uh, but the yellows and the greens really dark, which is over here. Uh, the red filter made the sky really nice and dark, made the yellows really uh, bright because it has some red in it, right? Uh, and finally, the green filter, uh, made the green grass at least a little bit brighter, but really didn't have much effect uh, on the sky or the barn. So the trick with black and white photography, I think, is, is to emphasize how some of the scenes may look in your mind before you take it uh, and say, okay, yo, you know what, this is a very bright scene. I have a lot of blue sky. Uh, boy, I bet a red filter would be great because I can really bring out the contrast in the, in the, in the sky. Or let's say you're in the forest. And you want that infrared type of look where the, the where the foliage is really really bright. Maybe you've got a pathway through the forest that's kind of dark, and then and then converting that from a color image to a black and white image with an emphasis on the green channel will really give that effect. So try it out. You know, you have, you have nothing to lose. You've got the color image to begin with, uh, but when you do a conversion, just don't do a simple desaturation. Try to do it with this emphasis again. I just don't have the time to go through every little step of how you do that, but there's a lot of stuff on YouTube. And it's just a simple slider that you're using when you convert black and uh, color images of black and white. It's called a channel mixer in Photoshop. And it's called, it's just uh, uh, color sliders on, on in Lightroom, but it's worth checking out if you're interested in this type of photography. All right, so those were the 10 tips, I think. Hopefully that'll level up your, your photography a little bit, whether it was composition wise, camera setting wise, uh, you know, black and white conversion uh, or certain equipment. 
And I deliberately left about 10, 15 minutes for the end for any questions that you guys might have. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. How are we doing? Okay. I have one question here. It says, can you please give an example of how to set something on a custom dial? Uh, I could. Uh, you know, it's uh, basically what you do. I don't have the a camera with me, but you, you set everything that you want. Let's say you want to aperture priority and you set the aperture to F4, ISO to 200, and you have that all setting. In the menus, uh, there's a there's a menu item that says, okay, take all this settings that you have currently and save it as a custom setting. It's just it's just one of the uh, one of the one of the menu items. Uh, it should be it should be pretty self explanatory. And basically, it takes all that and stores it on C1 or C2. And the next time you turn the dial to a C1 or C2, what you just saved goes on there. Okay, and the question is for quick action street photography or a rally, what focus point settings do you use? So as far as focus point settings, you know, for street photography, I actually shoot in manual. I shoot at aperture F8. I typically use a 35 millimeter lens and I pre-focus. I set the manual focus to about uh, three or four feet. Uh, and if you had F8 or F11 and you have and set it to auto ISO, everything within a certain distance that I'm walking is going to be in focus. So all I have to worry about is just taking the camera, click, click. I'm not worried about focusing at all because uh, within that depth of field of F8 and 35 millimeters, uh, what I want is going to be in focus. So that's how I typically do street photography uh, uh, and the settings I use for that. I use F8, uh, auto ISO, 35 millimeter lens, uh, and, and pre-focus or set the manual focus to about three or four feet in front of me. Uh, can you affect the colors black and white and post? Yes, yes, you can. Uh, when you convert a color image into black and white, there are little settings on the side, the color settings. So you could you could you could manage which colors get emphasized when it gets converted to black and white. So you can do this in Lightroom, and you can do it in Photoshop. If, in fact, you could. There's every editing software out there that I know of lets you do these uh, mixing of channels, color channels, if you will, to convert into black and white with an emphasis on certain on certain shades. Okay, last question. Do you, oh, that's one of the, okay. Do you recommend shooting the image in color and then convert it rather than shooting in black and white to start with? If you have a color sensor camera, yes, I do recommend you shooting it in color and then converting it to black and white. Because especially when you're starting out, like if you are a pro at this and you know exactly what, what you're doing, uh, and the problem with a lot of cameras, if you shoot in black and white, it, it actually doesn't give you the option to emphasize any of those color channels when you, it just does a straight monochrome. So I think if you have a color camera, shoot it in color and then later convert it into black and white um, in, your, in your software. Next question, of the ND filter systems that you shared, which is your preference? I'm thinking magnetic seams. So a lot of people, uh, are th th that's the new fad now. These <laughs> magnetic uh, filters that, got, that they're easy to change. I agree with you, but they're also easy to knock off. So I've I've tried them. Uh, uh, you know, there's several companies who've sent me filters with magnetic uh, attachments, but oftentimes I carry my camera on the tripod. I sort of sling it over my shoulder as I go from location to location. Any little bump on that on that magnetic filter will will cause it to fall. Uh, and that's, you know, if it falls, it has a chance of breaking and it's really, it's an expensive filter. So personally, I don't like using the magnetic filter system. Um, the, there are a lot of great brands out there. Uh, just don't cheap out on them because you're going to see it in the quality of images. And Nisi, for example, makes great uh, filters. I think they're, they're, they're one of my favorites, uh, you know, but there's also Lee filters, uh, certain Hoya filters also are great, uh, Breakthrough Photography, they're, they're all good brands. Uh, uh, basically, uh, if it's expensive, it's probably going to be good. <laughs> uh, but the cheap ones, they they often have a color cast to it. Um, the the glass that they use isn't isn't as high quality, so there's cost some softness to it. So that's that's why I recommend. Okay, when traveling, 
and not able to bring along a full-size tripod, do you have any suggestions for a more compact tripod? Also, can one that can handle a longer reach? You know, so I think there are a lot of great tripods out there now. Before, you had like one or two choices. You had like Gitso as a choice or a Manfrotto, you know, or really right stuff. They started coming out a few years ago, but they were really expensive. But there are now companies like, like Vanguard that make amazing tripods. Uh, uh, Leo Photo makes great tripods. Uh, some of the Chinese, Chinese so, and what I recommend is going carbon fiber. Uh, uh, oftentimes, the carbon fibers are a, a lot lighter, but there's but they're also a lot sturdier. There's a lot less flex to them. So pound for pound, carbon fiber provides a, a nice ratio of stability to weight. Uh, as far as a travel tripod, I'll show you the why. The one I uh, recommend. Uh, well, I thought this one. It's this one. Like I haven't haven't had with me. Uh, it's called. It's the Leo Photo Ranger LS two five five CEX. Again, that's just the one that I happen to have with me right now. Let me get my face out of the way here, so that it locks out. Yeah. Uh, but there are other manufacturers also that makes. I I really like this tripod because it has a leveling base right here built into the into your into the tripod, so you can make fine adjustments. Uh, right with that and it's relatively small uh, and lightweight so something like that is I think perfectly acceptable and yes it can handle like for example a 7200 f2.8 lens uh, that's about as heavy a lens that I put on that uh, so yeah next one are well, what are your thoughts on a variable ND filter versus right that's a great question so again I Nisi recently came out with a variable ND filter that's not as ambitious. So they only go from like one stop to four stop. So there are variable ND filters that go from one stop to 10 stop. And those are crap because basically variable ND filters are just two polarizers stacked on top of each other. And if you think about a polarizer, an ultra wide angle lens, if you, if you, if you engage that polarizer to its maximum value, you often get these little areas of brightness and darkness in the sky uh, specifically. So and that's what's gonna happen with a variable ND filter that's over aggressive. So like I said, Nisi came out with this new system where it's just one to four. So if, and you want, if you want more than one to four, you have an adapter that puts on a four stop ND filter on top of that. So four plus one, four plus two, four plus three, four. So you can go from one stop to nine or 10 stops with these two filters, one's variable, one's a fixed. So if you go that route, I think they work great. In fact, I've been using them and they and I haven't noticed any artifacts um, um, uh, when I shoot them, like bright patches or dark patches. But if you can't do something like that, they're a little bulky because there are two, two filters in one. Uh, uh, and I wouldn't go with, with any other type of variable ND filter for photography. Uh, I, would, I would go with like dedicated three-stop, five-stop, six-stop, 10-stop uh, ND filters. If that, uh, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, I was surprised that you got the water fountain spout and water and that Seattle skyline in, in, in focus Were you, uh, F eight in the show. So that's a good, so this was actually shot with a long lens. So I stepped way, way far back. So, uh, the further back you go, the, um, the less difference that the camera sees between something that's far away and something that's very far away. <clears throat> so the focus plane wasn't actually that big of a difference. Uh, between uh, between that. So I was pretty far away. If you look at it, it looks like a very compressed image. So in that case, <clears throat> I actually shot that at F16. Uh, it was probably shot with a uh, uh, 300 millimeter lens. Uh, so I was actually able to get both of them in focus. Uh, Paul says, I often experience dust spots on my images when working in post-processing. So irritating. Couldn't agree with you more. Uh, what do you use to reduce these issues on your lenses. So the dust spots is actually on your sensor. It's not on your lens. So you probably need to clean your sensor if you see a lot of dust spots. Uh, you know, whether you do that, have it sent back professionally or you get a kit to clean it, you know, it's, it's up to you. So yeah, if you're seeing, and oftentimes you see these dust spots when you're at a, at a smaller aperture, like F8, F11, F16, uh, the wider the aperture, F28, F4, the less likely you're going to see these dust spots because the focus plane is 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 is, uh, is so narrow that it's not gonna it's not gonna show these dust spots in your sensor. Yeah, so have your sensor cleaned. It's probably not your lens, 
Uh, and second, uh, you know, it, it really gets emphasized on a narrow aperture type of setting like f8, f11, f16. Uh, another question from Kim. It says, how long do you scout a location before finding the spot you like for the best composition? Well, it depends on the place. You know, uh, oftentimes it's not a question of scouting at once. Like I'll find a spot, but I'll have to go there multiple times, four, five, six times until the light is right, the conditions are light. So one is, is scouting the area. And second is once you found the area, uh, going there multiple times until until you're satisfied with what you get. Of course, you know, being what I do, I have I have the luxury of, of, of some of that time to to go there and do that. Uh, and, and I think I also realized that, you know, you're going to go to a place and you're going to see a bunch of people taking the same image, you know, that's fine. You know, that's reason it's iconic because everybody takes a picture, but try to find a different perspective, you know, try to, you know, compose it so that maybe you're looking through one element into the other. Uh, I think that's a little bit more challenging and oftentimes more fun and more satisfying when you come home and you got this great image that is from a location that everybody shoots, but has a slightly different perspective to it that makes it your own. Okay, one more. It's in a question here. I just noticed a speck of dust inside my 100 to 400 millimeters. Would that speck show up? Uh, almost no. In fact, it's very common to see, especially as older you get, especially the 100, 100 uh, I don't know if that's a Sony you're talking about or it's a Canon. I remember when I used to shoot Canon, the 100 to 400 was a push pull mechanism. And a lot of lenses that have this push pull mechanism, you know, end up getting more dust in the uh in the lens than it uh than than other did because that's just of the vacuum phenomenon probably uh, but if you do see a dust in the in the lens that it's going to have no effect i've never had that have any effect on my photography yeah the canon rf now is that canon r is that a push pull or is that a is that a turning type of uh uh, uh type of mechanism so if it's a push pull they're going to have a lot so a lot more likelihood yeah well it's, it's turning okay so it's not going to have any more than any other lens. So that's just, it just, yeah. Even though they're quote unquote weather sealed, uh, dust proofed, whatever. I have little dusts in some of my lenses and it's, I've never had it affect my photography whatsoever. Mahesh, if you open up your zoom chat, you'll have some more uh, questions from social media there. Oh, zoom chat. Okay. I am on my zoom chat. I thought, uh, yeah, I have, that was the last one was from was from John. Are there more besides John? That was in the Q and A module. If you oh, chat. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh wow. Okay. Uh, should I start from the bottom or the top? Whatever oh, no. you please. I'll go from the bottom. Okay. Uh, it says Judith says, "What iPhone app uh, can you use instead of buying a remote?" Yeah. So oftentimes, uh, each manufacturer has their own app. Like Sony has their own app, Fuji has their uh, own app, uh, Leica has their own app. You can use that app, often has a remote shutter function. So the downside of using the app to do the remote function is one, you have to wait for the app to load and to connect to your camera, whether it's via Bluetooth or, or Wi-Fi, and that can take a little bit of time. And oftentimes the range between your camera and your phone isn't as great as a dedicated, like a Bluetooth uh, or infrared type of uh, uh, type of uh, remote. And third, uh, if your battery, if your if your battery is running low on your on your phone, it may not work as well to do the remote release. So you can use it. I agree, uh, but I still like a physical release with me whenever possible. Uh, Okay, Hardish Singh says, how do you focus when using an ND filter? Right, so here's the trick. You focus before you put the ND filter on, particularly if it's a very uh, large ND filter, meaning that it's a very strong ND filter. So you have the ND filter off, focus in the area you want to take a picture of. Now, move the focus to manual focus. So now, if you put the ND filter on and you still have it on autofocus, it'll try to focus again and it'll hunt because it, can't, it doesn't have enough light to get that focusing. So ND filter off, focus, turn the switch to manual focus, put your ND filter on, take a picture. Uh, Monica says, what do you typically use for your white balance auto echo? So I shoot raw, so I just shoot in auto because that's the beautiful thing about shooting raw is that you can adjust your auto, your, your white balance to whatever you want 
after the fact. So I, I shoot, I shoot auto. Uh, Kathleen says, your information regarding filters for black and white is particularly helpful. Oh, thank you. Uh, do you prefer to shoot color and convert and add filters? No, I, if I'm shooting with a color camera, which most cameras are, most sensors are, I shoot in color and then convert to black and white because it gives me a lot more creative freedom about which colors I want to emphasize uh, in the conversion. Uh, if I'm shooting with a black and white sensor, uh, and I have a couple of cameras that 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 do that, then I put filters and color certain color filters in front uh, of the lens, uh, um, you know, as sort of in the field and no, don't rely on it as a as a post production. Barbara says, "Have you tried IR filters or IR photography? Any advice regarding that?" I have tried IR filters. Uh, they're great. They work great. I think. Uh, and as far as advice, it's just you know, a lot of it matters on the type of light, really. You need really strong light, really, like, it's almost like, in most photography, you want that golden light, that low light. In IR, I often find the best images I got were doing very, very harsh conditions. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are, if this is a whole topic in itself, I can make a one-hour topic just an IR filter, but, you know, you can actually convert some of your cameras uh, so that your sensor is more sensitive to uh, to the IR light. Uh, but short of that, you can get IR filters. They work fine, um, but I can get much of the effect that I want with just uh, emphasis on certain colors as I convert from uh, from color to black and white. Scott and Shaw says, "What? Well, excuse me. With the camera setting, do you use the under overexposure warning on EVF or use just the histogram? Oh, uh, I use just the histogram." Uh, because the under and overexposure, I'm thinking you're talking about zebras, uh, maybe, or or maybe the blinkies that you see. Uh, that's sort of like a zebra type of uh, function. Uh, I find they are, they only tell me what's happening at the extremes. They're telling me what's happening if something's too dark or if something is too bright. It's not telling me what's happening in the middle or the distribution of the exposure or color values in the middle. So I actually rely a lot more on the histogram than on these blinkies. Uh, Reza says, do you ever use the golden ratio? I use the golden ratio, you know, but I, that, that, that it's a little harder to compose for that, but I think that's, that's, that's a great, uh, uh, great uh, compositional technique. Also, I wanted to keep it a little bit more simple and rule of thirds is sort of universal. <laughs> uh, Hey, can you, s oh, we can't see all your slides. Okay, good. I think. I think I got all the questions, did I? Perfect. Well, I'm glad we had so much discussion uh, on this. It's uh, more than I uh, than I usually get or expect. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, this was helpful for you guys. Uh, and thanks a lot for inviting me, BNH and, and Sony, for sponsoring the event.